Hello and welcome to Connect. I'm your host, Randy Shabilo. On today's show, we'll have Sheldon Dingwall of Dingwall Guitars, Mandy Pravda from Wintershines Festival, and recapping that world record-breaking snowball fight with Team Canada member Chad Reynolds. As always, we'd like to connect with you. Tweet Shaw TV Connect. Find us on Facebook. Email Shaw TV Connect at Shaw.ca or call us at 306 665 3796. Saskatoon's music scene has always been vibrant, but a uh, little bit behind the scenes, I've invited Sheldon Dingwall, a president of Dingwall Guitars. Give us a little bit of insight into uh, his history in building guitars, bass guitars, and uh, where a lot of them have ended up over the years. Sheldon, t thanks for taking time today. Thank you, Randy. Um, well, I started in the late 80s on a kitchen table and, um, and worked up to, we're at approximately the second largest manufacturer in Canada of stringed instruments of any kind. Um, number one would be Godin out east and they're huge. They're like one of the largest in the world. We're quite a bit smaller than that, but most guitar businesses, uh, manufacturers are artisan shops where it's one, two, three, four guys. And uh, we're up to eight now. So maybe just back up a little bit about who you are and how you came to be. You've always lived in Saskatoon? Moved here when I was five, so yeah. for the most part. Yeah, um, formative years. Toured Western Canada for three years as a musician and learned a lot about what the needs of the musician are as far as when they're out there on the road. Uh, I have this saying where nothing ever breaks down at five o'clock on a, on a Saturday across from a store. It always happens on a Friday night in the hinterlands. Middle of nowhere. Yeah. yeah, so number one, your gear has to be reliable. And I think that's a really Saskatchewan type of value. Does the temperature play a, a big factor? I mean, you, you've learned how to repair some of the instruments first before you've gotten into actually building them, is that right? Did a lot of repairs. That was sort of, um, that was a way to learn what not to do. And um, it was a great experience. Uh, did probably 6,000 repairs over the space of a career. Um, working out of uh, the basement of HGL Music when it was on Broadway. Um, weather, temperature, humidity, they all affect an instrument. It's, they're made out of wood and wood will forever, for the rest of time, it will move when, when it dries out, it'll shrink. When it uh, rains, it'll swell. Um, there is no finish known to man that's gonna stop that. It'll slow that transition, but it won't stop it. So the wood is always moving and we have to account for that. Did you find out a lot of this when you were re repairing them in terms of what not to do, or what you need to do? Uh, and what you wanted, or did you hear that from a lot of the network of guys that you played with, uh, what they wanted to see in a, in a bass guitar, for example? Well, that's how we got into basses, was um, from customer requests. Uh, I'm not a bass player, so I had no idea what a good bass was, what a bad bass was, uh, other than um, from the outside looking in. Um, and I think in the long run that was an advantage because it forced me to have to listen to customers and say, well, what do you want? What's good? What's bad? I don't know. You have to tell me. And, uh, and I found you don't need that many people to tell you uh, the same thing before you've got something that'll appeal to the masses, like three people telling you the same thing. It sounds like that's a pretty small cross section, but um, we've had models that have lasted almost 20 years based on the input of three people. And, and when did your business start then? Uh, my memory's foggy, but uh, 1988 would be uh, as close as I can remember. Um, the paperwork got burned up in 96, so. Let's talk about that because that, that was a very, uh, I mean, I've known you a long time and I, I remember that fire in, at the Uncle Ed's building on First Avenue. Uh, and, and you had everything there and, and basically all was lost. Everything, um, including personal items too. So it was, uh, the next day I was out shopping for pencils to try and write stuff down and, and, um, you know, it was, it, I lost my shirt on that. I don't, I, I don't recommend uh, having a fire experience to anyone. It's not like you can control something like that, but uh, it's uh, certainly not something I'd want to go through again. Did that give you kind of the genesis of where you had to start over? And, and a lot of that was obviously between your ears. So putting all of that down on paper and then going the business from there. Um, did, did you find that as, as a bit of a shift in terms of the business where it had to go and... You know, I never thought about that, but you're right. Yeah. That 
was the pivot point where we went from being a guitar manufacturer that built basses as well to a bass only manufacturer. And the idea was at that time the basses were our number one seller so we, I could only afford to tool um, a couple of instruments so I said well let's tool the basses and then we'll get to the guitars in six months or so and I don't know 20 years later it's, we still don't do guitars so the basses have been strong since then. So are you looking for uh, materials for your guitars? Is there an experimental type of uh, program, if you will, that you'd follow? You're going to try this type of wood or you know different types of wood are more suited for what your applications are? Yeah, absolutely. And, and we use a lot of historical um, results from that. We'll look at what other manufacturers have done and, and uh, try and assess their shortcomings and their strengths. And we've, we've pretty much come to rely on, on uh, only two woods for necks that, that we find are structurally sound and sound the way we want. Um, for bodies, there's two or three woods that we use. Um, and then everything else, in terms of wood, uh, we would choose based on its appearance. It's not structural at all, it's just for appearance. And I am aware that there are some places that your bass uh, guitars have ended up as display show pieces, if you will. They're, they're more artistic works of uh, craftsmanship. Um, they've been featured in a few museums. Um, a few of them have hung in the, um, uh, I can't remember the name of the restaurant chain, uh, um, House of Blues. Uh, a few have been hung in the House of Blues. and um, uh, But for the most part, um, they're made to be played and, and they go out there every weekend and they either play in a church band if, if that's where you play or they're played on uh, the road and in clubs and things like that or concert stages. When you look at uh, where the business has come and, and I, I use the fire as the starting point, um, do you think that uh, people look to Saskatoon in terms of the music scene or is it your reputation or word of mouth that the, uh, the bass players would typically say, have you tried the Dingwall guitars? and try mine or that type of thing to get your word out? Yeah, the, the internet's been huge, so um, I've heard the term word of mouth, and um, that's been what's driven our sales um, for as long as the internet's been around. Um, we've never really had the budget to be able to take out large ads, and uh, you know, maybe we would have grown faster and we would have been able to pay off those, uh, those ads if we would have gone that approach, but I always felt that Again, Saskatchewan mentality, um, charging extra for every instrument to be able to turn around and throw it into marketing um, is not a good use of the customer's money. I'd much rather put all that, uh, all that, uh, that money into paying us to build the best base we can and then let them go and, and tell 25 friends. That's your marketing. Uh, word of mouth, yeah. yeah. And, Perfect. And um, it, it's a slow growth method, but uh, it's very solid. Um, we have customers that have been with us for 25 years. Most of them have bought second and third and fourth, and in one case, 30 of our instruments. And um, uh, they all become like friends and family. Can we name drop a little bit in terms of where your product has ended up uh, on the stages of or around the world or different? Uh, we talked a little bit before about uh, you know, recording how that works from studio to studio. Yeah, uh, so our, our number one endorser would be Leland Sklar, and he's a studio musician, so he would play with um, with all the A-name or A-level uh, talent like Rod Stewart and, and Phil Collins. Right now he's in Europe on tour with Toto, and uh, I think we got a short clip of uh, the last time he was out with Toto. Um, and... Uh, but they've been on albums with, from Nickelback to Metallica to Rita McNeil to uh, um, Loretta Lynn, Ricky Skaggs, uh, Lyle Lovett, Willie Nelson, um, and some of the newer bands that are really driving our sales now. Uh, unless you're 25 or under, you'd never have heard of them. But if you're in that age group, these guys are like the Led Zeppelin of their era, uh, a band called Periphery. And we've got another video with uh, uh, an artist named Nolly that plays with them. There's also uh, some furry people that play this uh, guitar-like uh, bass of yours in the Muppets. Oh, yeah, right. A yeah. little bit of a clip on that. 
That you didn't actually make that. That was just kind of a takeoff of uh, what you had. That I believe was filmed in London, and I'm, I have no idea uh, what puppeteers they used, other, th other than they used the Muppet um, aesthetic. And uh, that was totally out of the blue. I'd never even heard of the band before. And this video shows up in my inbox, and it's like, wow, is that ever cool? <laughs> it's one of yours. It's one of that's the video I'm most proud of, actually. <laughs> um, when we look to the future. Uh, different music styles are obviously emerging. What do you do to keep up with that? What do you see on the horizon for your company? Well, um, just be responsive to our customers. Uh, uh, a lot of the new music styles, you know, take a while for my ear to get adjusted to. And so I really have to rely on them. And, and uh, if they need something, um, we have to figure out how to fix it or make it work for them. So we're constantly sending out instruments to our artists for them to try. Uh, new pickups, uh, we introduced some new pickups in January um, and uh, the response was really good but again um, until we get feedback from somebody that's out there in the trenches and using them in a really tough environment um, uh, we won't release them until we get their A-OK. -okay. So there's, that's your R&D then, is uh, taking things on the road and letting them try it, give you the feedback, and then developing from there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when you look at, and I, I keep saying the future, uh, do, you, do you plan on expanding or do you want to keep it that intimate one-on-one uh, -on -one type of relationship that you've already maintained? Well, it, it's, if you would have asked me this two years ago, um, I would have said we're just going to maintain course and, and keep the growth the way it's at. Um, but in the space of two years, uh, where previous to that, uh, my entire career, uh, we had zero competition in our market niche. And um, uh, the, the popularity of our instruments in Japan has awakened some of the sleeping giants there. And, and now we have competitors with hundreds of millions of dollars worth of capital every year to, to throw at any, to any um, uh, market they want. And this year they picked ours. So uh, we're not going to lay down without a fight. We're going to push as hard as we can and expand as fast as we can. And, and um, that includes distribution in Europe. And, and um, it, it's a little tough to get into South America, but we're aiming pretty hard for there as well. I think you're well on your way, Sheldon. I really want to thank you and congratulate you on over 20 years of experience and your business here. And I wish you all the best in the future. Thank you very much. Yeah. We'll be right back.